Welcome to this web-based seminar, TB and Correctional Facilities. My name is Rajitha Bhavaraju, and I am a training and consultation specialist at the New Jersey Medical School Global Tuberculosis Institute, which is a component of the Northeastern Regional TB Training and Medical Consultation Consortium. Today's program is sponsored by the consortium. The objectives for today's program are listed on this slide. TB control remains a public health challenge in correctional and detention facilities in which persons from diverse backgrounds and communities are housed in close proximity for varying periods. Effective TB prevention and control measures in correctional facilities are needed to reduce TB rates among inmates and the general U.S. population. In July 2006, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued revised guidelines entitled Prevention and Control of Tuberculosis in Correctional and Detention Facilities. This web-based conference will summarize these recommendations and use a case example to illustrate the point. Today's conference will consist of three parts. First, Dr. Mark Lobato will provide an overview of prevention and control of tuberculosis in correctional detention facilities. Next, we are very fortunate to have Maureen Williams from the state of Connecticut who will share a recent case presentation from the state. And finally, we'll have time for discussion and questions. I would now like to introduce Dr. Mark Lobato. Dr. Lobato is a New England tuberculosis consultant for the Division of TB, TB Elimination at CDC. He's collaborating with the six New England TB programs to develop capacity and learn the best practices for the elimination of TB in low incidence areas. In the past, Dr. Lobato has served as the team leader for the TB Evaluation Workgroup in the DTBE representative to the Immigration Customs Enforcement Policy Workgroup and lead in the TB in Corrections Working Group. His research includes evaluating TB in two large urban jails, finding missed opportunities to prevent TB and LTBI, conducting a multi-site study of workforce treatment for LTBI and for LT recommendations to observation control on the U.S.-Mexico border. This has been deployed for many outbreaks, not just in TB, but for other diseases. He has published in the field of both TB for both adults and children, as well as HIV. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Kovada. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank the uh, Northeastern RTMPC for the invitation today and a chance to focus on TB prevention and control in correctional and detention facilities. I think this is one of the cornerstones of contemporary TB prevention and control. I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, a couple slides on TB surveillance in correctional facilities. Then we'll move right into the guidelines of what's new with these guidelines compared with the uh, previous guidelines. We'll review some of the content in more detail with a focus on how the guidelines apply to health departments, and then have a discussion at the end of the questions and answers. So the first graph shows uh, national surveillance data from TB cases, which are the red bars. And these are in a 1 to 10 ratio because of the scale. So um, in, the, in 2005, those aren't 1,400 cases, they're 14,000 cases. The yellow bars indicate TB cases reported from correctional facilities. As you can see, there's been a notable decline in TB cases within correctional facilities. However, in 2005, we've had 595 cases reported from correctional facilities, which is the largest number of cases reported in the last five years. So I think this type of surveillance is showing us something's going on within this population we need to pay attention to. This next figure shows some key risk factors for uh, cases, both in correctional facilities and non-correctional facilities. As you can see, the frequency of risk factors such as homelessness, excess alcohol use, and drug use is much higher within the correctional population than in non-correctional TB cases. What's new with these guidelines? Where were they published? First, we were charged by Dr. Ken Castro, Director for the Division of TB Elimination at CDC, to base new recommendations on existing evidence. These are evidence-based guidelines where evidence existed. Where it didn't exist or was inadequate, we used a consensus approach to reach expert uh, recommendations in this field. Second, the recommendations take into consideration detention facilities. While the previous 
recommendations only address correctional facilities. So these facilities are where uh, persons may be detained without long-term stays are booked and later released or transferred. Thirdly, we use uh, an approach for risk assessment to guide us in recommendations for TB screening. Fourth, we make clear recommendations that all inmates should have some type of scre uh, TB screening, at least symptom screening. And finally, we address the use of quantifiron within this setting. One of the things we'll be focusing on today are the highlights of collaboration, education, and evaluation. These are areas that health departments play a large role in uh, TB control within the correctional setting, including case management, which is a large component of the current guidelines. We also expanded the environmental control section and have uh, very specific guidance for respiratory protection and even some uh, reference for designers of new facilities so they can take uh, into consideration TB control when new facilities facilities are being corrected. And finally, for the first time, we uh, recognize the importance of uh, foreign-born inmates, in particular those that may be detained by ICE. And so we have a special section regarding these type of inmates. TB programs are leaders in promoting collaboration and should be involved in uh, the correctional setting in a number of ways. But I think very specifically we define collaboration not as communication. This does not mean you know somebody there to call, but it is a very organized approach where there are designated liaisons on both sides that they have some regular meetings and that ideally there's a written agreement between the correctional system and the health department on what are the roles and responsibilities for each party. One of the very important areas, which we'll talk a little more about, are contact investigations, where the health department are essential, uh, given their expertise in this field, to help guide correctional facilities where contact investigations are being done. And finally, a discharge planning of soon-to-be-released inmates is another role that the um, health department can play in the collaborative process. I'm going to speak both about jails and prisons, but I think jails are, are somewhat unique and distinct from the prisons because they are much more a community institution. As this schematic demonstrates, detention and correctional facilities are not isolated institutions by themselves, but a part of a larger community that may, needs to be taken into account. So the TB control within a correctional facility will help tra uh, reduce transmission in the community, so we need to be particularly involved to make sure that things are done right within the correctional facility which will make uh, our work much easier within the community setting. The working uh, group that uh, put these guidelines together addressed the first the major issue of, of screening. What approach should all facilities take for screening new inmates? So the approach, the first approach for TB control is that upon intake, all inmates should have symptom screening for TB. In the past, uh, I think it was a little vague what symptoms uh, questions should be asked, so we give specific guidance on what minimum questions should be asked at the intake. The issue is also who should be doing those questions is addressed. I know in some facilities that the officers themselves do that uh, screening and others, the healthcare personnel, a nurse or another trained healthcare um, person will do that screening. In any case, it's essential that the staff that's doing the screening is trained on how to ask the questions and then trained what specific questions to ask. In these recommendations for correctional facilities, we relied very heavily on a number of recent recommendations that came from CDC over the past couple of years, including the treatment recommendations, uh, infection control recommendations, contact investigations. So these guidelines address in certain areas, for example, treatment and case management, specific specifics to corrections, but uh, in many instances we refer to these more detailed documents that uh, have recently been, been published. I think, again, for case management, the key point is that 
uh, this is, needs to be a collaborative process between the facilities and the health department. It requires communication and coordination, and that that process needs to begin early before inmates are released, that we give a number of recommendations and also specific examples from facilities of models that work in order to help promote continuity of care uh, once the inmates are released. Discharge planning is um, the final process of, of case management. Uh, again, it's a collaborative process. In some facilities, which are usually large cities, uh, health departments may have the resources to be able to actually go and interview inmates within the facilities before release. This, in some uh, examples, has helped facilitate uh, transfer of care upon release. The next area that we addressed was training and education, and this was a new area for the recommendations. We addressed this to correctional administrators, the healthcare professionals in the correctional setting, and the health departments. Again, the health department can play a critical role in training and education because we have a lot of experience in this field. We have materials. We have, have health educators. And so we bring both experience, we bring expertise, and can help uh, train staff for these facilities. Some of the key areas that we focused on where training and education is need needed is the pathogenesis and transmission of tuberculosis, signs and symptoms, which is crucial for knowing for screening and for assessment of patients, airborne infection isolation principles, which are uh, recently have been updated by CDC, and the treatment of TB and LTBI. Evaluation, I think many of you from the health departments, uh, in particular the state health departments, know that the Division of TB Elimination and CDC as a whole has been placing new emphasis on evaluation of public health activities. In the TB arena, um, all state TB programs now have evaluation plans. This expectation uh, carries over to the TB program in correctional systems. Uh, assessments should go on for the risk of TB transmission within these facilities. Data should be collected in a uh, organized way, preferably that data should be in an electronic um, system that can be easily retrieved and analyzed. And certain key outcomes such as timing of chest x-rays, timing for isolation should be gathered. These data should be periodically analyzed and conclusions should be presented uh, to both the health departments and to the correctional staff, rectify any problems and to improve TB control within, this, uh, within these facilities. So this is another area that is totally new to the current guidelines. Contact investigations is an area that uh, health departments have a lot of experience in, and it's an area in which we can help promote collaboration. It carries over from the facility to the community, and you'll hear more about that when Maureen talks about a, a recent uh, experience in Connecticut. The goal of the contact investigation first is to interrupt the, the TV transmission that's occurring within the facility, so that first the first thing is to identify the source case and identify any secondary cases. So collaboration with the health department is crucial in, at the very beginning stages of contact investigations. I think the, one of the uh, important guidance that the health departments can bring to the facility is the scope of the investigation and setting priorities on inmates to be tested, who should be tested first, and uh, to what extent should inmates be tested. Uh, often facilities don't have that experience. Their last TB case may have been several years ago, and they wind up testing everybody. And there's a lot of needless activities, while priority patients may not be put on treatment for LTBI in a timely way. A large section of the, do of the document uh, regards TB testing. We all know in these facilities there's large volumes of inmates are passing through them. Uh, in the jails, the testing 
sometimes not completed because there's a uh, high volume of turnover within the first 48 to 72 hours. We did make a recommendation, however, despite that uh, challenge, to reduce the amount of time that the TST should be done. The previous document gave a window of 14 days in which the TB evaluation should be completed. Uh, we changed that to, we raised the bar and expect that the evaluation can be done within the first seven days after intake. Now these are for inmates who have no symptoms. Obviously if an inmate comes in with its symptoms, a more timely evaluation needs to be done. We did not take any specific uh, preference for the type of testing that should be done. Most facilities we know are using the tuberculin skin test. Some of the larger facilities, like Chicago, Los Angeles, Orange County, and California, use chest x-ray for screening. Some areas are beginning to become familiar with the quantiferon test, and we consider that a, valued, a valid alternative to the tuberculin skin test. However, we do not state any preference for one test over another. The, the facilities themselves, based on the amount of TB they have, the volume of inmates and their own resources should decide which is the most appropriate test for them. We did not change recommendations that HIV infected persons, no matter which test that they receive, whether it's a TST or quantiferon, should also have a chest to x-ray done. We understand that more and more persons with HIV infection are placed on heart and they will have a reconstituted immune system at the time of their testing. There is evidence that given their immune status, they may not need a chest x-ray, but we did not feel there was enough evidence at this time to, not, to change the recommendation requiring a chest x-ray as well. So we're in a new year, we have new recommendations, and hopefully at this point you've realized that we are promoting uh, that health departments need to take the initiative, make the effort, and begin the collaborative process if you haven't done that already. On the facility side, with the help of the health departments, because part of the risk assessment involves a assessment for risk of TB within the community, but basically the approach is to assess the facility, and we define two categories. A minimum risk facility is one that has had no TB cases in the last year. They do not house a, a large proportion of a, what we call high risk population. Now I know some people are thinking, well, aren't all inmates high risk? Yes, compared to the general population, but within the inmate population we know there are other groups, subgroups that are at higher risk, and these, some of these groups are HIV infected, inj injection drug use users, and foreign-born individuals. If those are not large proportions of your population, you're still a minimum risk facility. Other facilities that don't meet these criteria are non-minimum risk facilities. So the approach in the minimum risk facility is, first, all inmates should have a symptom screening. Any inmate with t symptoms suggestive of TB should be immediately, immediately isolated in an airborne infectious isolation room. That's the new terminology, what we used to call negative pressure rooms or respiratory isolation rooms. The individuals in minimum risk facilities will require further evaluation if there's a clinical condition or risk factor for TB. So if you're a minimum risk facility and you're screening all your inmates with symptom screening, you do not need to do then a TST on all inmates. However, there are individuals with higher risk conditions. Those individuals should be screened with either a tuberculin skin test, a quantiferon, or a chest x-ray. So this is the schematic, the algorithm for screening a minimum risk facilities. I'm not gonna go through each one. This is in the guidelines, and uh, we don't really have time to go through step for step, but basically it just summarizes what I said. You start with symptom screening. If there's symptoms present, you isolate. We're not testing all inmates, but if an in individual inmate has a TB risk factor, then they need some type of TB test done. Non-minimum risk facilities 
will have universal screening. These are higher risk, higher risk facilities. So symptom screening occurs shortly after entry at booking or shortly afterwards. And then the TB testing should be done within seven days. Many facilities, particularly prisons, will screen at intake. Other places don't have the resources to do it immediately, and these inmates will be screened in the next uh, several days. What happens if you have a positive tuberculin skin test? Well, the first thing to do is evaluate for TB. If the chest x-ray is normal and there's no symptoms for TB, and the person is considered to have LTBI, then treatment for LTBI should be considered. We'll talk a bit about that in a minute. This algorithm basically hasn't changed from the old guidelines. I would just like to point out, um, again, HIV-infected individuals need a chest x-ray regardless of their screening test result. And for long-term facilities such as prisons, we recommend that a two-step tuberculin skin test, uh, if TSD is being used, should be done on their initial testing. So in summary, the recommendations, uh, first of all, if there's a TB suspect case in the facility, it should be reported to the local or health or state health department. We know from the field experience that uh, there have been some problems, in particular from federal facilities that thought they do not need to report to local health departments. We make a statement very clear, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons was one of the participants in these guidelines. Federal facilities should report and need to report to the local or state health department. Screening should occur at entry with a symptom review. There should be periodic, at least annual, risk assessment of the facility, and the facility classified either as minimum risk or non-minimum risk facility. That risk assessment will then decide what type of screening needs to be done within that particular uh, facility. If the facility or system, because there may be multiple facilities within a system, if screening, TB screening is done, it should be completed within seven days after entry. Any inmate who is suspicious for TB or has symptoms suggestive of TB should be isolated immediately. Planning for discharge should start early and should be in collaboration with the local health department. And then finally, there's, again, a special section on ICE detainees. Some of the recommendations are not particularly new, but we did place a higher emphasis or renewed emphasis on certain aspects of the um, guidelines. For example, treatment. Treatment of TB is a priority, and we refer to the uh, current guidelines for treatment. Latent TB infection uh, may or may not be um, something the facility initiates. In short-term facilities, we've seen repeatedly that inmates start treatment only to be released shortly afterwards without completing. In these instances, if the inmate is not going to stay long enough to complete treatment, it may be best not to start treatment. Now, what is completion of treatment? The recommendation is preferably nine months of INH. However, six months of INH is considered adequate. Four months of rifampin is an alternative and may be used in uh, short-term facilities, increasing the the proportion of inmates that do complete treatment. We uh, expand on collaboration between health departments and the medical staff in the facilities. We've talked about that already. That's probably the highest emphasis um, outside of treatment for TB cases. Contact investigations, outbreak investigations are one of the key areas for collaboration to occur. Finally, we also include evaluation, which is a new component of TB control in the correctional facilities, and we provide guidance for training and education. Just going to talk a little about the airborne infection isolation rooms, because uh, in some facilities may have these rooms on site. Other facilities, uh, if they don't, they will either have or should have some understanding with a local hospital for transfer of TB suspects to isolation. Isolation should be immediately initiated for any patient who has 
a sign or symptom of TB disease. Any Im inmate who's coming in with a history of TB, TB disease that has not completed treatment should be isolated and evaluated. And any patient who's on treatment but their infectious status is not known should be isolated until FUTA can be obtained. Discontinuing isolation is a little different than uh, may occur in other settings because we are releasing inmates into a population, some of who may be vulnerable, particularly to TB disease if they are immunocompromised. Release from isolation can occur if there's another diagnosis made. Now, if a patient has three negative AFB sputum smears, the patient can be released. However, I want to be uh, very cautious with this setting because we've seen repeatedly inmates are released back to general population because they have three negative sputum smears only to find a few weeks later that the cultures come back positive. So I think if there is a suspicion for TB and if infectiousness is low, that patient can go into general population but should go on therapy, preferably for drugs. And if they are symptomatic, isolation should not occur until they are showing clinical signs of improvement. The treatment are, are following the 2003 guidelines. We don't have any real differences with that. The, the, those guidelines don't specifically say that universal DOT is recommended, but within this setting, all patients should be on DOT. Uh, lengths of treatment, drug, drugs used, drug doses is, um, have no really difference from the 2003 guidelines. So uh, I know we're all mute at this point. Um, I did have a couple scenarios, though. Uh, I guess it, you can either type in um, a message to me or we'll just provide an answer for you. These are some experiences we've had with different facilities. Um, the first one is in facil uh, prison that occurred in 1999. I think many of you know this. It's published in the MMWR where an in inmate was entered into the facility, was known to be, have been previously infected, was known to have LTBI, was not treated in the facility, then later reactivated his TB, and as a result, the outbreak, there were uh, at least 15 cases resulted within that facility. So how could this outbreak have been prevented? Well, I see several people writing here, so... Obviously, treatment for LTBI in a long-term facility of prison should happen, should occur. There are very few reasons that inmates within a prison should not and cannot be treated for LTBI. So this is an outbreak that was totally preventable. Jacqueline, thank you. An inmate expected to leave before completion of LTBI, even four months before camping. In a prison, usually, you know, length of stay is more than nine months. If there's going to be an early release, we certainly can use four months of rifampin. So thank you. And I think that's an underused regimen, so um, people in the field may want to think about that and talk to their facilities about that as an alternative in specific instances. Um, so again, for LTBI, because I think this is an area that's under addressed within the correctional facilities, uh, we need to prioritize patients. I said if you're going to be in, if you're not going to be in long enough, then it's probably not necessary to start the treatment, somebody who's in a month or two. However, I think there are exceptions to that. If you set priorities, certainly any inmate who's immunocompromised, an inmate that's converted their TB test, uh, a contact to a TB case, all of these inmates should be started. There is no reason to defer treatment. And we've already gone over uh, the regimen, so I won't repeat that. This is another facility that uh, had a multi-year outbreak. There were, over this time period, a several-year time period, 40 TB cases among inmates. A larger review of TB cases within their jurisdiction showed that almost half of the cases of TB had at one point or another been incarcerated in this facility. Furthermore, there was documented community transmission. 
of TB with the same strain. So what might have indicated that this outbreak strain was prevalent in the community? Actually, 25% of cases were this strain. We didn't talk about this, but I think uh, many of you know that all of the states are participating in the CDC genotyping TB program. And this is a new adjunct to TB control and I think can be used very effectively in helping us TB control in the correctional facility. It's actually been used in the outbreak that we'll be discussing shortly. In summary, the new guidelines uh, have new recommendations, it has new emphasis on several old recommendations, and uh, the key, I think, again, to success for TB control is ongoing direct involvement by health departments working in collaboration with the correctional medical and administration staff. So I want to thank you for your attention and time. We'll um, have questions, I, I believe, at the end. Thank you, Dr. Lobato, for an excellent presentation. And yes, we, we can have questions at the end. I do have two questions myself that um, one had come in to me, and that was to expand on the, um, the current abbreviation, the new abbreviation now that's ICE, I-C-E, if you could just expand upon what that means. And I, I don't know if you could talk about the origins of that word, but I think people are, are curious about what that means. Yeah. This was previously known as INS, so ICE is the Bureau of Immigration Custom Enforcement. It's a part of, of the uh, Department of Homeland Security so that undocumented immigrants who may be detained for immigration status, they will either be held in an ICE facility. There are facilities throughout the United States, I believe about 35, 40% are held in these facilities, or they will go to a contract jail or prison. If the person is apprehended for criminal charges, then they will be held in a uh, criminal setting, again, either in jail or pr a prison, until their sentence is served, and then they will be transferred to a nice facility for removal. So approximately five years ago, Division of Immigration Health Services, which is a branch of HRSA, Division of TB Elimination from CDC, and at that time, INS, later become ICE, uh, formed a working group. And there are now currently a number of algorithms to help track patients as they move through the system. They may be going from contract uh, jail to a contract prison, and then to an ICE facility, and then deported. So it's a, quite a complex route. They may be transferred through multiple facilities. So there's been a national effort to try to develop protocols and help track patients and maintain continuity of care and at either release back to the community because about 25% actually of detainees, ICE detainees, will stay in the U.S. or if they're removed from the U.S. to try to link them to care in their home country. Okay, thank you. And we actually have one more question that came in um, via uh, UNA, the typed in questions. And the question is, is there an electronic system available for data analysis? And I assume that's probably something that is that is specific to uh, correctional facilities in general. I, I don't know if you're aware of that, if you can answer that question. There are different systems. There are, there are proprietary systems that are available. Um, I think Orange County was using one I looked at. I know Washington, D.C. jail, they developed their own. They had a grant from, uh, I believe, the U.S. Marshal Service or someone. They developed their own. But there are also systems that may be, because really, in, you don't need a complex system. Uh, I know some prisons and jails have um, collaborated with health departments and adapted existing electronic databases for tracking their LTBI cases. So I just can't tell you, yes, go out and get this one. It's available on the website. But the, I think working with uh, your state or local TV programs, there are databases that can be used or adapted. There's also a written in question here, and I was <laughs> hoping no one would ask this question. But I, I, I did say in the assessment of risk assessment of a facility, that non-minimum risk was considered if you had no TB cases or if you didn't house a high percentage of high-risk individuals. So the question here is what's considered a large population for foreign-born at high risk? So we don't have a cutoff. I mean, I think that's a judgment call. And again, the foreign-born, if you're foreign-born, need to come from areas of the world where TB is prevalent. 
So if you were in Rhode Island, for example, and I'm, I'm not, I don't have the statistics, but if a large percent of your foreign-born were from Portugal, then they may not be considered high risk. But most parts of the world outside of Western Europe, Northern Europe, the United States and Canada are high risk areas. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. And a number of other questions have come in and we will try to get to those at the end. Otherwise, I'd like to let you all know you can email us additional questions and I'll, I'll give you the address for that later on so we could perhaps answer those later. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Maureen Williams. Ms. Williams is the nurse consultant assigned to the TB control program for the Connecticut Department of Public Health. She's also the TB education and training focal point for the state. Ms. Williams has a long history of public health services, particularly in communicable diseases, as well as teaching at the college level. She has her master's degree in nursing, and I will now turn the program over to Maureen. Maureen? I'm going to move on to the um, second slide. Hello, everyone. I want to be sure that everyone realizes that I'm presenting this information today, but that it, you'll be able to tell that it's repre representative of a lot of work that's been done in the local health department, the local medical care facility, the correctional managed health care, which is the health care for uh, incarcerated individuals in the state of Connecticut, but it, and our own Department of Public Health. But we also benefit, um, certainly in these slides, from having had an EPI-AID um, team come to uh, Connecticut at the um, beginning of December and spend like 14 plus days reviewing all of our information, reorganizing it in, in some of these beautiful slides. So uh, you'll be able to see the um, influence of all these different areas. Thank you. I'll speak first. This is the story of two cases of TB in Connecticut. The index case was a woman approximately age 24 who presented within the correctional system with upper respiratory symptoms uh, during the month of December 2005. And she um, repeatedly returned to the medical unit saying that she was feeling worse and feeling worse. She had, in fact, been an inmate for the full 12 months prior to the symptom onset and had also been an inmate from May to August of the previous year. So altogether, she was an inmate within the system for 15 of 19 months prior to the onset of symptoms. And in Connecticut, we do have kind of an unusual situation in that all of our women only go to one facility. Uh, there may be women's uh, beds at lo little local jails, but in terms of many of the local towns and all of the um, long-term care, uh, long-term stay, facilities. It's just one facility for women in Connecticut. So she had actually been 15 out of 19 months at that one facility. When she entered in December of 2004, she did have a uh, non-reactive TST. When she presented with these upper respiratory symptoms as December wore on and her symptoms didn't improve, they planted a, re, uh, a second TST, partly also, though, because she would have been due anyway. They do um, TSTs every 12 months in this particular facility. At that time, she did have a 20 millimeter PPD TST. And when she had the follow-up x-ray, there was an infiltrate on the x-ray. She was placed in negative pressure the day after the PPD was placed. And she, um, they did collect at the facility two sputum specimens. Both were smear negative for AFB. And in our situation, that also takes a few days because the specimens actually have to be sent out to the state lab. In the meantime, she did start on treatment with Biaxin, and she definitely improved. So the decision was made that she didn't need a third sputum specimen, that um, there's actually a note in her record that TB had been ruled out, and so uh, she was just returned to the general population on the 30th of December. So she only spent a couple of days in uh, negative pressure. She was released back to the community January 6th. In looking at what happened at the corrections end, in some ways, yes, she, she did have good care because she was placed in isolation, specimens were collected. But um, three specimens were not collected. Maybe she would have had a uh, smear positive on that third one. Although she was identified as a conversion, a, a TST conversion with an abnormal x-ray, they didn't initiate any treatment even the, for latent uh, or for TB disease. I mean, certainly they could have considered TB disease treatment at that point. They didn't educate her about this uh, being an unusual situation that um, she definitely needed follow-up 
and of course that's based on what she's giving us for information a month later but she definitely did not was not impressed with the information that she was given about her positive skin test there was no planning for release for her to get uh, tuberculosis care in the community she was told to call um, an infectious disease provider at a uh, hospital and when she tried to call that office they told her to go to the emergency room to be seen before they could give her an appointment in the office so again she didn't think that that was a um, that didn't make any sense to her because she was feeling better so that without planning for the release there was no coordination to actually identify a community provider for her the institution itself also didn't seem to recognize this as a possible sentinel event, that maybe there was a TB exposure occurring in their facility, and uh, they didn't initiate any of the mandated reporting that, from the state point of view, we'd like to do so that we'd like to get so that we can uh, communicate with the local health departments and try and get some follow-up. When she arrived in the community, she did not seek any care. As I said, um, the sputum specimen was reported by the state lab to the state health department as a culture positive finding after she had been home approximately two and a half weeks. So at this point, by, the, by luck and by the grace of God, she happened to have a fairly stable um, residential situation. And when they went out to find her, they were able to locate her at the address that had been given. She reported that her symptoms were no worse at that point, and their arrangements were made for her to um, get care with a community provider. So in all, she was another three weeks before she began treatment with the four drugs. And during that three-week period from discharge from the facility until starting the drugs, she had shared a household with her children who would not have been previously exposed. They had not visited her just prior to her discharge from corrections. She had had multiple appointments appointments with probation. She had not had as many with social services, but she also had had a job interview and took temporary work at a local boat show. So she had had, there were some potential opportunities there for um, additional spread of TB germ in the community. So then that, that's the first girl, and that began, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, um, began a contact investigation at the correctional facility. But in the meantime, there was a second person that we didn't know anything about, and who, in fact, probably is the source case for everything that I'll be talking about. She um, also was a woman, also age 29, had been an inmate, and again at the same facility, from May 2005 until December 2005, well, January 2005. When she, was, when she entered in May 2005, she also had a non-reactive TST. The facility does ask the questions about exposure to TB disease and uh, current symptoms and ever been treated for TB in the past. And the inmate had denied all of that, denied that she had current symptoms, denied that she had ever been treated in the past or told she had TB in the past. The first documented upper respiratory symptoms in her record were in July, but she reports that she had some upper respiratory symptoms the whole time she was in the facility. The first x-ray that was ordered for this source case, which is case number one, was done in August the 25th. Uh, and there was a right upper lobe infiltrate at that time. So, you know, many times you'd say, well, there would have been an opportunity possibly to replant a TST or to review the symptoms, uh, review her past history, possible exposures, and consider some uh, collecting some bacteriology. In fact, what happened was that from that period of August to December of 2005, this particular inmate was treated with antibiotics and inhalers, combinations of different ones, on five different occasions. No additional TST was done. No symptom review for TB was done, you know, specific for TB. The remark was made in the record that she, that the client, the inmate, of course, was TST positive on entry, and there was no effort to really replant another TST. And because of the persistent respira upper respiratory symptoms, she had another x-ray in October. And although the first radiology report had not referred to tuberculosis, the second radiology report uh, clearly said that this persistent right upper lobe opacity could have been due to previous TB infection. But in, within the institution, no action, no steps were taken to isolate the inmate or to collect any bacteriology. So she actually was released to the community January 6th. So of course, we'd say it would have, what 
could have been helpful in, in trying to fully evaluate this uh, inmate would have been repeating the skin test, reviewing the same TB history and exposure um, questions that are done at the beginning of their stay in, in corrections, suspecting based on that October x-ray that the client, that the inmate did have, could have had active TB. And then uh, based on the isolation bacteriology and beginning treatment because of that suspicion, then there would have been planning and collaboration with the local, the state and local health departments for release. There would have been more education to the client that this was uh, an important thing to follow up with on um, discharge. And the mandated reporting, again, would have alerted us that this, was, this person was um, available in the community and had been available in corrections. So, so the person came in, as you might know, I mean, this does happen in a lot of places. She did go seek care after she was discharged from the community. She, this is, now again, I'm talking about the source case. She did not have a stable housing situation. And so she, in fact, had lived at one uh, address prior to her admission to um, corrections. And when she was discharged, she lived with at least four more groups of people within the community. She did seek care at the community health center, and her uh, family and friends did indicate that she had been sick for a long time. She had these three different uh, evaluations, none of which resulted in a strong suspicion of tuberculosis. She also went to the emergency department at the local hospital in both January and February. The chest x-ray in February did say TB cannot be excluded. But again, the, the x-ray wasn't evaluated with a high suspicion of uh, active tuberculosis. One sputum was collected, but it wasn't sent for acid fast bacilli. It was only sent for respiratory culture. And based on some, something that she said it, apparently at one of these visits, the physician started her on rifampin and one of the fluoroquinolones, but when this sputum respiratory culture report came back as negative, they stopped the rifampin and they didn't pursue anything else related to tuberculosis. So with the persistent symptoms that she was having, she again presented um, in April and was sent for a chest x-ray. And the recommendation of the radiologist at that point was for her to have a CAT scan. A CAT scan was done in early May. And this radiologist that read the CAT scan, and again, you know, all these providers in the emergency department and in the community health center were different providers on different days. And the radiologists were different radiologists, although they did have access to the prior film. The CAT scan was very alarming to that radiologist who called directly to the community health center who encouraged them to send her to be admitted uh, to the hospital. And the community health center was able to reach the um, client and have her admitted to the hospital on May 3rd. So she started treatment May 4th. You'll see that the epi aid group feels that she was probably infectious uh, for that whole year prior to that treatment start date. We know she w had a a large uh, bacterial load at the time she was finally admitted because she remained spear positive for numerous AFBs for well over six weeks of uh, treatment, even though she was tolerating the therapy. The particular area of Connecticut or the part of Connecticut that we're discussing are where these two, where the correctional facility is and uh, where the source case resides had uh, all together in that county only 21 cases of uh, tuberculosis reported in the five previous years. Of those um, cases, 71% of them were born outside the United States, and none of them were associated with any correctional facility. In fact, most of the staff associated with the women's, the women's correctional facility doesn't recall the last time they had a TB outbreak um, or multiple cases in their facility. The town in which the source case resided had seven total cases over that five-year period, of which six had been in non-U.S. born individuals. So again, it was uh, she wasn't uh, what you might have considered in that area to be a typical suspect TB case. The testing at the Department of Corrections involved well over um, the population that was tested was uh, 700 plus inmates and almost 500 staff, of which a good number of each uh, group may have had um, multiple tests. But uh, they, the result was just 63 positive inmates identified from the population that still remained once 
this identification of her as a case in May showed up. So they're certainly part of the, that correctional population that had been discharged to the community between the time this, lay, this uh, client left corrections and was identified in the community. And 10 staff members were identified as um, now having reactive um, skin tests, which represented about 2% of the tested population. The inmates represented about 8% of the uh, tested population. The real action turned out to be in the community. The family contact investigation initially, and you'll see at the bottom it says as of July 2006, um, involved about 37 people, and of those 37 people, four were identified to have tuberculosis disease. Two of those initially identified with disease were children under two, and two were adults. Um, an additional 11 people were identified as being positive for latent infection, of which six were pediatrics or um, children, school age and, and younger children. And adults uh, were five additional adults were shown to have reactive TSTs. Uh, 13 did have non-reactive TSTs, which was 35%. But of course, you, you know, really hate to think that uh, only one in three people are going to be negative. Eight people were not tested. Uh, were, were tested but did not have results. And one person was reported as having a previous positive. So this is looking um, at the actual, what happened to us, what we've just been discussing are the cases that were identified in May. The number five case was a, um, a young child also under two years of age. And the decision was made not to hospitalize him for gastric aspirates. So, but he was um, heavily linked within the um, social network of the of the source case number one. Number seven and eight were adult cases where um, they were epidemiologically able to be linked with the um, active case case number one, but did not um, actually grow out on specimen. But of note, the number six case, um, which these are three cases that showed up in October of actually late September of 2006. The number six case was actually uh, shown by genotype to link back to the other uh, yellow cases. So um, the culture confirmed cases, all the specimens were sent for genotyping, and um, with a very slight variation, um, appear very likely to be all linked um, by genotype findings. So in general, saying like I did that we had uh, that particular town only had seven cases in the previous five years, now I'm uh, saying, well, they, they actually had nine cases related to this, the source case herself, plus the additional um, identified uh, adult cases, which was an additional five uh, cases, all ranging in the 20s to um, 21 to 36 years of age. All of them were women uh, who developed active tuberculosis. In the pediatric cases, there were three uh, cases uh, linked, of which two were female. Uh, and their ages were uh, 10 months to 19 months. So it was a very young. And each of those three children represented a different household that the uh, client had stayed with, the source case had stayed with after le leaving the correctional facility. All the individuals were US born and were uh, black. So this is one of the benefits. Uh, some, some of these slides already were um, slides from the epi -Aid investigation, but this is also a um, uh, slide from the epi -Aid. You can just If you knew me, you'd know I can't make these kind of slides. But um, this particular slide does demonstrate for us what I wanted to show was that this person, the index case, or not the index case, the source case, actually had resided with a friend who turned out to be the epi-linked case number eight. Plus her son also um, had a reactive TST, another household member had a reactive TST. So that was 100% evidence of transmission in this household. Then the um, source case was admitted to DOC, and there she had um, contact with zero with the index case, who was our first identified case, but doesn't seem to have any um, connection to the social network that the source case belonged to. 
but also the case number seven had also overlapped for approximately four months of the time that case number one uh, was in corrections. Case number seven also was a community contact of the uh, client. So um, that was another, uh, the index case does indicate transmission in the correctional facility. Uh, over here in the uh, first household that um, the um, source case stayed with, that she being number one, one of the children lived in there, that's case number four, plus the uh, mother of that child and the sibling of that child are TST positive, so again, 100% transmission in that household. Uh, the client um, source case then went and stayed with cousins who established two separate households, and um, so they were uh, this uh, two and six and three and five. And actually, case number two, uh, we have to give a lot of credit. Case number two was an infant that was admitted to the hospital around the same time case number one was. And um, when the hospital staff noted that the families were, uh, that people were visiting both the adult who was up in isolation and visiting on the pediatric floor, they asked about any connections that there might be between those two. And then another adult was identified, um, case number five was identified also as a visitor to case number one in the hospital. So uh, the hospital really um, did a tremendous job in terms of rapid identification of some of the cases that were related to the original case. And this is, so all of the, these uh, community cases ended up being uh, processed either through as inpatients in the hospital or through the um, infectious disease clinic associated with that lo local community hospital. So that was a huge job that they did at that time. Um, this is, again, the benefit of having the EPI-8 investigation. What they did was look at the social network involved. Case, um, case number one is our identified case, and she's over here. Case number one over here is actually when she is um, probably in corrections, I think, and this is where the... Um, case, the one corrections related case that we've identified at this point. Um, but again, then she's numbered over here. This was her community um, starting place. And she's linked with this huge mass of individuals. Plus, she's linked to all these little households. Um, you know, all the each, each of these gray buildings is a household. So what it shows um, in a way that you can almost not believe is how really the one child that was a short-term stay for the um, woman coming out of corrections was uh, linked within that social network, but not as strongly as the rest of the individuals who eventually were diagnosed and began treatment for active tuberculosis. So, um, and one of the things that this is to show is that um, these yellow um, uh, yellow boxes are people that now, based on uh, case number six, may need additional testing. Or in some cases, like over here, this was a daycare center that was identified as a contact to case number four. There were some children still not tested there. But you can see at the daycare center, there were two positive um, TSTs here, but the rest were either negative TSTs or will will hopefully be uh, retested on their second testing. Some of them are still missing their second test. But they were, um, on the first round of testing, there were only two positives and no uh, positive TSTs on the second test. And of those two positives associated with the daycare center, neither one that was their daycare attendance, their only risk factor. They both had additional risk factors. So that's what this uh, social networking diagram is um, showing. I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it? So if, unfortunately for the local health department, you can just imagine what this is like when this is the kind of context that you're dealing with and the kind of context that you're um, doing, uh, trying to identify and do testing on. It's just been a huge job. And the hospital has participated in a lot of that testing. But again, it's just been a huge job for both of them uh, in terms of the what normal resources were being devoted to tuberculosis and now what it represents at their local level. It's just been massive. 
Uh, and certainly you can see there's still some yellow boxes left, so there'll be additional testing still underway. Some of the things that have already un are already underway in c within the correction system, because that's really the group that you're wor you know we're talking about today, is that uh, contacts who were inmates during that period of time are being flagged for um, screening on reentry, regardless of when their last skin test was. And uh, at annual testing, um, they're being uh, flagged as contacts, so that the test, the TSTs will be interpreted at five millimeters and not at ten millimeters as they ordinarily would be. Um, there's a new, uh, there's been an effort to re-emphasize, just like Mark said, the treatments of. Um, treatment within uh, a correctional facility should be able to be prioritized, in particular for identified contacts to active cases. The HIV positive inmates who were released during that time uh, that the uh, two cases were in corrections have uh, were um, identified and uh, the local health departments were asked to try and find them for to get additional testing and, and medical evaluation. One of the other policies that had kind of gone by the wayside within the correctional institution was okay. that for TST positive inmates there wasn't an emphasis on HIV testing and for newly identified HIV testing test HIV positive inmates, there wasn't an emphasis on skin testing for TB, and that's going to be reinstituted. Another thing was that their employees were not having two-step testing on hire. Um, and so what we're just trying to emphasize here is that implementing the guidelines can certainly could have certainly helped us to identify this uh, inmate prior to her four-month stay in the community when we really had a huge number of additional cases that um, you know could possibly have been prevented. Uh, so again, uh, I think these are all guidelines that Mark spoke about. So um, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Maureen and Mark, for two very excellent presentations. I'd now like to open the floor. You could either type your questions in to Dr. Labada or Ms. Williams. If you have any questions, you could type them in specifically to them or to me. Or if you um, feel like, you can um, unmute yourselves by pressing pound six and ask your question on the phone line. So um, I'd like to open the floor to questions. In the meantime, while we're waiting, Maureen, a quick question for you. Since you're sort of looking back at the situation, and I know you also had excellent partnerships with the, the individuals that you acknowledged early on, can you make any recommendations? And I'm asking this also since you're the education focal point for your state as well, sort of proactively in other states, what can people do to sort of get together with their, from a public health standpoint in terms of working with the correctional providers? Right. From an educational standpoint, sort of outreach, what are some things that, that people can do in a, in a proactive way to, to deal with TB in their uh, facilities or screening? Well, it, interestingly enough, in Connecticut, the State D Department of Public Health TB Control Program does help fund one of the positions in corrections for the correctional managed health care. It is a contracted health program. So that ha there have been um, exchanges, you know, there's been communication. There's a, a designated uh, DOC contact person within our DPH office as well. But what we find is that a lot of times, even when the screening is happening in a timely fashion, the reporting to the person who's really the one of the infection control nurse positions within this correctional managed health care, she's not at any correctional facility site. So there's all, almost always a delay in reporting to her. But what we have found is that those specimens, ten, sputum specimens that are collected, usually are sent to the state lab. And we at the DPH are getting all the state lab um, reports. So we can see when specimens have been submitted. And uh, we can see what the initial smear results are. And then we do get the final corrections. You know, we get the final culture results on those specimens. But certainly, I think you, utilizing, recognizing that people who come into corrections are probably, are, are often not the best historians right at the time of their arrival. So unless they have very blatant upper respiratory or T, active TB kind of symptoms, they're usually, uh, they, they may not accurately report what their TB history was. This individual, the source case, had in fact been told in uh, 10 years previous that she had active tuberculosis, had begun on therapy for that um, treatment in, in New Jersey, and had uh, been lost to follow-up. And so 
we would have had no access to her New Jersey correctional information in our records. We do try to maintain a state database, too, so that when facilities identify somebody, they either connect with their own infection control person and reach us, or they call us directly to ask us about past histories of disease or treatment or identification with positive TSTs. Because certainly we see lots of people for whom the TST may be negative on arrival, and yet we, even within the correctional history, they have multiple positives previously. So it's not always, like Mark was saying, there's something to be said for two-step testing on inmates. It's just not always a possibility. But we, we would like to see people do more when the symptoms present and go back and re-ask the TB questions. We have a question that was typed in, um, and that was, with discharge planning, it was stated that interview by the health department should occur before release. So the question is, does this mean that the TB, does this mean for all TB as well as the latent TB infection cases as well? And I think I think the crux of the question is, is that do most health departments follow inmates with latent TB infection upon their release? What sort of the standard of practice in, in many places? I think either one of the presenters could perhaps answer that one. Well, I can speak from the Connecticut end. It, if, the, if the inmate is released on medication for latent infection, Tom, the, that information is communicated to the DPH DOC liaison, and he communicates that to the local health department. In Connecticut, all the local health departments do not have the staffing or the capacity to go out and look for them. If they're only P TST positive and they're not started on medications, it is entered in our database, but that information is not always communicated. But we do try for active cases to have local health departments wherever possible. To, we try to facilitate an, a visit with the inmate prior to discharge to the community. And we do have that occur. I, I think the practice varies across the country, and many locales have no follow-up for inmates with uh, LTBI. In the recommendations, we, we do try to encourage facilities to at least, if not make appointments for follow-up, at least give um, information to the health department, like lo locating information, and to give uh, an address where the inmate can receive treatment. Now, again, getting back to this issue of priorities, I think that's the average inmate who has a positive skin test there are higher risk individuals at high risk for progression to TB disease. Those individuals, I would say, need some type of discharge planning, the immunocompromised, the contacts, the, the recent the converters, because these people are at high risk for developing TB disease. So we know there's limited resources. We do what we can, but a high priority in, inmates with LTBI need special emphasis. We have another question that came in. I'm going to direct this to you, Dr. Lovato, about the necessity to have skin testing done on patients with HIV. Why is skin testing necessary on HIV-positive patients when chest x-ray is generally done on admission? Well, as you know, there's no one test other than a culture that diagnoses TB. Usually we have a collection of information, both historical and physical exam and test results so that the, the TST is just one more piece of information. So if the person has an abnormal x-ray, it can be many different conditions. So the TST sort of tips us, if it's positive, tips us closer to thinking more about TB. Again, many people are on treatment now so that they have intact immune systems and they should be responding to a TST compared to the previous guidelines when there was no effective therapy. So I think if you're screening HIV-infected individuals, they should get either a tuberculin skin test or a quantifiron test and an x-ray. That may vary. Some facilities may decide that the x-ray is not needed if, if a patients are in care in a long-term facility in a prison and they have CD4 counts and they know that uh, viral load is low. That may be a clinical decision not to do the x-ray as well. Thank you for this discussion. Um, unfortunately, we seem to be um, out of time. If you have additional questions, you may email them to me, and my email address uh, should be on the screen, as well as you can call them in, and I will forward them to the presenters as appropriate. And also, um, the individuals that worked with Maureen on her investigation have also offered to be available for any specific questions about that investigation or, or ways in which that, that things had, had worked out. So 
um, we appreciate them being able to uh, be available for that. The Global TB Institute also provides medical consultation services, so you can also call 1-800-4-TB-DOCS with any questions regarding medical consultation as well. I'd like to thank you all for your participation and your input in, and uh, the types of questions that you asked. And again, if you have future questions, please feel, feel free to email them to me or to the speakers. And I thank you very much for your time. This concludes today's conference.